Uh, Zoe's going to come and preach in a moment. Uh, it's in the book of Ruth. So if you have a Bible, please turn to the book of Ruth, chapter 2. If you don't have a Bible, look up on the screen. Ruth chapter 2, verses 1 to 13. <coughs> now Naomi had a relative on her husband's side from the clan of Elimelech, a man of standing whose name was Boaz. And Ruth the Moabitess said to Naomi, let me go to the fields and pick up, up, up the, pick up the leftover, leftover grain behind anyone in whose eyes I find favour. Naomi said to her, Go ahead, my daughter. So she went out and began to glean in the fields behind the harvesters. As it turned out, she found herself working in a field belonging to Boaz, who was from the clan of Elimelech. Just then, Boaz arrived from Bethlehem and greeted the harvesters. The Lord be with you. The Lord bless you, they called back. Boaz asked the foreman of his harvesters, Whose young woman is that? The foreman replied, She is the Moabitess, who came back from Moab with Naomi. She said, Please let me glean and gather among the sheaves behind your harvesters. She went into the field and has worked steadily from morning until now, except for a short rest in the shelter. So Boaz said to Ruth, my daughter, listen to me. Don't go and glean in another field and don't go away from here. Stay here with my servant girls. Watch the field where the men are harvesting and follow along after the girls. I have told the men not to touch you. And whenever you are thirsty, go and get a drink from the water jars that the men have filled. At this she bowed down with her face to the ground. She exclaimed, Why have I found such favour in your eyes that you notice me, a foreigner? Boaz replied, I've been told all about what you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband, how you left your father and mother and your homeland and came to live with a people that you did not know before. May the Lord repay you for what you have done. May you be richly rewarded by the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge. May I continue to find favour in your eyes, my Lord, she said. You have given me comfort and have spoken kindly to your servant, though I do not have the standing of one of your servant girls. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading and the preaching of his word. So if you want to come out, I'll say a prayer for you before you pray, before you preach. I'll pray, you preach. <laughs> Lord, we thank you for that passage of scripture and we pray now for your blessing on Zoe as she opens it up to us, as she says to us what God wants to say through it. Anoint her, bless her, use her, we pray, for your glory. In Jesus' name. Thank you, John. God is good, isn't he? And this morning, I was just sat there smiling to myself, knowing that I'm going to come and share on God's provision in our lives, just uh, personally thinking to myself how thankful I am for you, John, and how you are a, go uh, a gift of God's provision to us uh, here at Hope. And thank you for leading us this morning. But God's provision at work. This morning, we're going to be focusing on Ruth chapter 2 together. But before we do, I want to ask you a question. And go with me as I ask you this question, because I'm hoping it will become clear as we go on together. Because I'm wondering what your just-so-happened story is. What your as-it-turns-out story might be. Let me 
explain myself for a moment. There are probably multiple stories in this room, I think. The one where you get chatting to someone, and you, as you're talking, it turns out that you have mutual friends. Or my auntie lives near to where you grew up. Or I went to school where your husband's family lives. And I love those stories because as you're talking to someone, the connections start coming out, don't they? The, the network is actually much smaller than you think. And I have many of these stories, it feels, in my lifetime. Growing up on a rural dairy farm in Devon, everyone knows everybody. And then when you are part of church circles as well, people know people. When I tell people that I'm part of Hope Baptist Church and I'm minister in training here, if they go to another church somewhere in the city, they might actually, and I've had this on a few occasions, say to me, I know someone who goes there. He's an accountant. And then it goes on, I think his name is Tony Jobson. You're very well known in the city. But we have those stories, don't we? Those kind of connections with people. But what do I mean by what is your version of the just so happened story or as it turns out? I think to qualify as it, as it turns out, then there's like a kind of a mini checklist that I go through. So what qualifies this kind of story? I think you're left afterwards with the expression where you go, you just couldn't have written that. Or what are the chances of that happening? Or quite a common one where you go, well, I never. What is your it turns out story, I wonder? Because my favorite it turns out story involves my parents. And I love my parents. They are absolutely incredible people. I've had the biggest influence on my life and it goes without saying that I wouldn't be here without them. But they've given us so much love and an environment to grow up in and explore faith. But their it turns out story is how they met. And that's a wonderful question to ask couples, isn't it? How did you meet? But my parents met in France on an Oak Hall holiday. Now, some of you might be familiar, they're kind of Christian holidays, and you can go, on, uh, go abroad and go on adventure. But they both went independently with their friends and met on holiday in France. And it turns out that they only lived 17 miles apart from each other. One in Sidmouth, one in Columpton, if you know the area. But their circles hadn't crossed, they hadn't met each other. A farmer and an occupational therapist meet in France. And it just happens they live 20 to 30 minutes away from each other. And I love that story. But I wonder what your it just happens or it turns out to be story might be. Because that's the phrase that we find today in these 13 verses in Ruth chapter 2. And when I read that, it just opens the whole passage up for us, I think. We read about a few things that turn out to be the case. And the way the narrator is telling us about these events leaves us going, surely that's not a coincidence. And he's illustrating and portraying to us a God who is orchestrating each and every event. So where are we in the story so far? The scene is set. The story zones in on a family who are living in the days where the judges ruled. A community calling out for kingship leadership where the community are living in sin, in strife, and in famine. And then we meet Naomi, who is experiencing such grief as her family move from Bethlehem to Moab, and along the journey, she loses her husband and her two sons. She is left bitter and bewildered by her circumstances, and Ruth, her daughter-in-law, clings to her and goes on the journey with her. And this is such a gift of God's provision. And last week, we were asking the question, why did Ruth go with her? And I was suggesting, perhaps, that maybe she has tasted and seen the God of her in-laws and then doesn't want to lose out. A Moabite woman, excluded from the assembly of God, is on a mission. She's clinging on, writing herself into God's story, making a claim on the land, the people of God, and the God of Yahweh. And last week, I repeated the phrase quite often that Ruth is writing herself into God's story. 
And I suggested that Orpa, Ruth's sister-in-law, perhaps writes herself out of the story because she exits and she stays in Moab. But today, studying these 13 verses, I am wrestling with the same question. Who is writing the story? Ruth says yes to God. She pursues him. She clings on to Naomi. She plays her part in the story. But here we see today multiple as-it-turns-out moments or it just so happens. And we are reminded that God is the one writing and orchestrating his divine purposes through this narrative, through this story, through these people's lives. Ruth is saying yes to God, but God is providing all that she needs. And today, I want this to be a reminder to us that God uses us, that Ruth both acts decisively and pursues God. We see her gleaning in the land for food today, but God is the one orchestrating and providing for all of her needs. It's both and, God and Ruth at work. We've been almost studying each character as we go, haven't we? Viewing the story from their perspective. First, Naomi through this burden of bitterness, and then Ruth, as I've said, clinging on, pursuing God. And next week, we'll study Boaz's role in the story, his kindness as such. But today, it's almost as if we are studying God's role together, which says ridiculous, it's ridiculous to say out loud. But I kind of think the narrator is ironically showing us the coincidences of where God is at work. The synopsis of Ruth chapter 2 at the beginning is we are introduced again to two very vulnerable women, both widows, but this time they're in Naomi's land, not Ruth's. But we don't know what hope they have. They have no land, no connection that we are aware of to family or that they are aware of. They only have their faith in God. And for Ruth, perhaps this is a new faith, a forming faith. We've said last week how she is on a faith journey, claiming this God to be hers. And we know that Naomi's relationship with God at this moment is full of bitterness, that her view is that the, the God Almighty is against her. But like I've said already, the narrator is pointing out for us these turns out moments where God is providing for them through his law. And we kind of see the law as a framework of safety, allowing these widows to find shelter and revealing to us God's consistent heart that never changes. So let's just consider that for a moment. Where are these moments that I see? The first one we read about comes at the very end of chapter 1, verse 22. We are told, so Naomi returns from Moab, accompanied by Ruth the Moabitess, her daughter-in-law, arriving in Bethlehem as the barley harvest is beginning. So why is that significant? Because it turns out that God has a plan, or a framework, or a safety net in the law that ensures that the vulnerable, the widow, the foreigner, the sojourner, the alien in the land would be provided for. A framework that was limited to a certain point in the year, harvest time. We read in Deuteronomy chapter 24, verses 17 to 22, the following commandments for the people of Israel to live by. Let's read it together. It says, Do not deprive the foreigner or the fatherless of justice, or take the cloak of the widow as a pledge. Remember that you were slaves in Egypt, and the Lord your God redeemed you there. This is why I command you to do this. When you are harvesting in your field and you overlook a sheaf, do not go back and get it. Leave it for the foreigner, the fatherless and the widow, so that the Lord your God may bless you in all the work of your hands. When you beat the olives from your trees, do not go over the branches a second time. Leave what remains for the foreigner, the fatherless and the widow. When you harvest the grapes in your vineyard, do not go over the vines again. Leave what remains for the foreigner, the fatherless, and the widow. Remember that you were slaves in Egypt, and this is why I command you to do this. Here we read this clear instruction for the people of God to remember their heritage. They were slaves in Egypt, 
They were impoverished, living in, the, in a foreign land. So the encouragement for them now is to leave food behind for the foreigner. Don't take it all for yourself. Don't go back over it a second time, only having concern for yourself. Leave the corners, leave the edges, leave the leftovers behind. Why? Because we see repeated throughout scripture the Lord's heart, care and concern for the weak, for the orphan, for the widow, for the stranger, for the alien in a foreign land, for those in need, the poor, the outcast, the hurting. And Jesus later models this heart for people in the way he chooses to spend his time with people. And Ruth and Naomi, they're in this vulnerable, volatile situation, but it turns out the law historically written into the story of their people would provide for them. The law reveals God's consistency. It's a thread throughout scripture. The Lord provides and defends the fatherless, the widow and the stranger. So after a brief discussion in verse chapter two, uh, sorry, verse two even of chapter two, we kind of see Ruth go with Naomi's blessing to glean the land. But here we go. I think before we see our next it turns out moment, we are let into a secret, I feel, by the narrator at the beginning of the chapter, where in verse one, we are told that there is hope, but they don't know about it yet. It says, now Naomi does have a relative on her husband's side. I kind of think we're not to tell anyone that yet. It'll be a surprise to them, like we're kind of planning a surprise birthday party. But he is from Elimelech's family, which is Naomi's husband who died, his clan. And not only that, we are told, we are let into the secret that he is a man of standing. What does that mean? That's code for wealth. He is a good, honourable person, and his name is Boaz. So then when we pick up the story again at verse 3, we read that Ruth goes out and begins to glean in the fields behind the harvesters. And then we read it, it says, and it turns out that she found herself working in a field belonging to Boaz. And we've been told who he is. What are the chances? Well, I never were supposed to go. Maybe I'm over-egging this this morning, but I want you to see this, that God is consistent. He's the one orchestrating the story. He is in this. His nature is being revealed. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He never changes. His nature and character is consistent. His ways are the best ways. His law, his word is providing a foundation for life for his people to live by. And it's an expression of his grace and his character. It's for the vulnerable. It turns out the Lord has a plan in their pain. And he's setting out a framework for his people to live by. The Lord provides for all through this kind of practical action of gleaning. But then we see the Lord provide personally for Ruth through Boaz, through this practice and through this framework known as the Kingsman Redeemer. And again, this is another law, another cultural practice of Israel, where if a man leaves behind um, a family, if the man dies and leaves behind a wife without a child, or leaves behind some land, or is still alive and has become indebted and enslaved to someone else, in between the years that we know about the practice called the year of Jubilee. So if this happens in between the 50-year kind of freedom and cancellation of debts that would take place, then a family redeemer would need to step up. And they were the ones who had a responsibility to marry the widow, to protect the family with the aim of having more children. Or their job was to buy back the land to release them from slavery. So that either the ashamed or the deceased man would have a name in the land going forward. And it turns out that Boaz is connected to the Elimelech family. And it turns out that Ruth is in his field. And we're left going, what are the chances of this? God is in this. We see God's nature and his laws are there 
to reveal his character, which is to release people from slavery, see the widow protected, and his name and generations continued. It turns out, well, we knew this all along, that God's heart is for the widow, the stranger, the vulnerable, the enslaved, and the foreigner. Anyone in a precarious position. But the story goes on, and Ruth is working really hard, and we read that she only rests once, and she catches the attention of the owner's land. Boaz asks the overseer of the harvester, the harvesting going on, whose woman is that? And they know her story, so they reply and they say that she's a Moabitess coming from Moab with Naomi, and she's asked to glean this land. And Boaz extends extreme kindness to her by saying, you, you're welcome to glean here. Stay on this land and I will protect you. And I have told the men not to touch you. And this reminds us again, the precarious, vulnerable position that she is in. And Ruth is amazed by his kindness. And she exclaims back to him, why are you treating me, a foreigner, in this way? And this suggests to us that Boaz is going above and beyond the law and his duty now. But he replies saying, I know what you've done for Naomi. The sacrifice you have made, and, ha and now I want to pray for you, that you might be richly rewarded by God. And then it's as if he play, prays, I think, a blessing over her. And I think this blessing is beautiful. He exclaims to her, find refuge under the wings of God, in whom you have come to find refuge. And that's a beautiful image, isn't it? Ruth is finding refuge and shelter under the wings of the Israelite God. Because do you remember from last week, it turns out that Ruth is a Moabite woman. What does this mean? We saw her reaching out, grasping out to be part of the assembly of God, to be part of his story. And then today we read a blessing that she is finding shelter under the wings of God. And that's an image that we're familiar with familiar with in scripture, but it's an image they are familiar with, especially as the people of Israel, because Moses uses it as a metaphor between how God has protected Israel so far. This shows us again that God is consistent. We have the same image of God, his heart and his nature turning up here. just want to read a few verses from Deuteronomy chapter 32 verses 10 to 12, because this shows us God's consistent nature again, where Israel can find refuge in God. So it says, in a desert land he found him. This is God's relationship with Israel. In a barren and howling waste. He shielded him and he cared for him. He guarded him as the apple of his eye, like an eagle that stirs up its nest and hovers over its young that spreads its wings to catch them and carries them aloft. The Lord alone led him. No foreign God was with him. This is language that is showing God's intimate relationship with Israel and how he is caring for his people like an eagle that stirs up the nest, hovers over its young and spread it his, spreads his wings out to catch them. God is shielding his people. He is guarding them. He is providing them a place of refuge. And that's the blessing that Boaz uses and speaks over Ruth. May you find refuge under God's wings. We now see Ruth, a Moabite woman, under the protection of God. His, his laws kind of provide a framework of safety for her. She is to glean and to fend herself within the structures of God. And it just so happens that God is orchestrating a redemptive plan all along because she finds safety in Boaz's field. For us today, I'm really hoping that this reminds us about God's consistent character. Throughout scripture, we see God's heart for the widow, for the orphan, for the alien in the land, the vulnerable and the impoverished. And today we're going to be talking about the soup run in a moment. How today, God's framework for support to reveal his redeeming and consistent nature to a world that needs him is his church. For his church to model his generosity to a world and society that 
doesn't glean, who instead takes all that they need and finds it hard to share its leftovers with anyone. God is calling his church to be a generous people, to model his nature, his abundant generosity and provision for people. Because it turns out that we are his plan to con- as a church to continue to provide his protection, his shelter and his refuge for the, vid- for the widow, for the vulnerable, for the orphan. For those that are enslaved and indebted, for those that need to hear the good news of Jesus, who ultimately provides the ultimate rest and freedom. Today we're thinking about gleaning, this discipline of God's provision for those who need it. And we're going to hear about the soup run in a moment, how I believe that's a practical application today where we can extend and reveal the consistent nature of God to others that need it. Because what we see going on is God says to the Israelite nation, remember you were once slaves in Egypt, therefore there was a so what, wasn't there? Leave behind food for others. Today we are a freed people and it's The challenge for us is the same. What are we going to do as part of our worship to help free and extend that grace towards others? Because it turns out that we have experienced God's incredible generosity in our lives. And so there's an encouragement for us to extend that to others. What are we doing to extend the shelter and protection of God to those around us who need it? Today, we've been thinking about God's provision. How it turns out that God is at work. And it turns out that God uses us to extend and offer an invitation of his refuge and his shelter to the vulnerable, revealing his nature as the God who protects those on the margins. So before we respond practically this morning and in prayer together, I'm going to invite Bronya to come and um, help us just profile what we're doing at the moment in terms of our work with the soup front. And I've asked Bronya too to share some stories of provision where we've seen God provide uh, for those in need, where we've seen God kind of, the prayer that we use for those that are familiar with kind of involved in the soup run at the moment is this loaves and fishes prayer, where we have seen God provide miraculously everything that we need for those that we are hoping to help. So the first question we're just going to think through together is, what is the soup run, if you're not familiar with that? And what is our current involvement at Hope? And then just to share ways that we could get involved, a practical application from our word this morning. So we're part, most of you, or many of you will know, we're part of Plymouth Soup Run that goes out 365 nights a year to serve and feed some of the most vulnerable of our city. Hope Soup Run are responsible for every Monday evening. This whole ministry, we believe, is truly love in action. And we have so many it just happens moments. And as Zoe said, those of you involved in the prayer team or in any way it's just been incredible how God's really blessed us and provided so we're really grateful for the huge number of folks involved all working together for this common goal so in a nutshell Zoe and I just gonna tell you some of the areas that we've split things into so we now have a team of coordinators which break down what's needed in different areas and hopefully lightens the burden for everyone So one of these teams are the team that collects the food that is kindly donated to us. Um, So that's free food from M&S. That's a collection on a Monday night. And then there's food from Nando's and KFC, as well as the pasties that we give out. And the pasties are also collected on a Monday. And the chicken is collected on a Friday. And Charlie Dore um, organizes this team. And if anyone has free time around 4 o'clock on a Monday or on Friday morning that could help us collect food to give out, we'd love to hear from you. And if that's just once a month, once every six weeks, that would be really 
great. Then we have the kitchen leads. This is really important role. And they plan and they buy food as necessary and lead the prep teams that we have coming in. And actually, if you love to get involved with helping uh, kitchen coordinators, then we would love to support them by having people from the church come in on a Monday night, as well as the external teams to help prepare lots of sandwiches and lots of food. So chat to us. We could do with about six to eight more people to help in the kitchen. But also people give clothes and sleeping bags and toiletries. And that's another way that people can practically help. And then there's a team that comes in that go out and they um, meet and engage with the people and feed them soup and the sandwiches um, and serve those on the streets uh, from all across the city as we stop on the bus in four different places. So again, as we say, we're hugely blessed that serving teams up are made of teams, from, as we say, all across the city and in individuals and as well as folks from here at Hope. We use our minibus that I uh, always call Bessie and there is always a driver who is the team leader for the evening. The driver is responsible for the smooth running of the evening Briefing the going out team, we may have heard from Soup, Plymouth Soup Run themselves something that's happening in the city. It might be a safety concern or it might be somebody to look out for. Um, so we brief the team and they maintain safety and they make decisions on referrals. We can, if we meet street homeless people, we can find out where they're likely to be sleeping and pass that information on so that then they can be found in the morning and hopefully we can help get them into the system to find them accommodation. And that's uh, just a few jobs that they do. But distinctive to us, each Monday night we send out two prayer pastors and their role is to offer spiritual support to anyone and a listening ear when we hear stories. And the serving team enable them just to go out and mingle and chat and listen to any of the suit run clients that are interested. And um, as they do that, if it's appropriate, they offer them prayer, and that is really well received. We're also there for the teams um, that we go out with uh, the, as, as prayer pastors, and it's good to outreach to those we serve with. Sometimes it might be the only time they come in to contact with people from church or Christians, and I think often churches these days might have a bad name, so... As we mix and mingle with them, we, you know, it's hopeful that they see something in those of us that go out from church that is different and they want to know more. Um, the prayer pastors will bless, do a simple blessing to those in the kitchen. And I don't think we've ever been refused and nobody's ever said, no, I don't want a blessing. And we also bless the team as they go out. And then there's a, a, t a team of people praying at home on a Monday night and they have notifications via WhatsApp when we pray for people if there are prayer needs. Um, they kind of get put in the WhatsApp chat so people can be praying at home as well, praying live as we're out on a Monday evening. So those are a few different practical ways that you could get involved because I think today's passage is practical. The discipline of gleaning is a practical outworking of the law, which is God's nature revealed to us. So if you want to get involved practically in any of those ways, collecting food, uh, helping in the kitchen, offering clothes and resources, going out to offer the food, um, driving the bus, praying live at home or being a prayer pastor, then we'd love to hear from you. And today also there's an opportunity to give financially to the Ward's Soup Run. And there are two ways you can do that. There's a box at the back just being modelled by the host team there, that if you want to give any cash donations, you can do. Or if you use the card machine, there's a way of the money going straight to the soup run. Because we do, um, this costs the church, in, and we fundraise with money, obviously, uh, as we buy lots of food and, and sleeping bags as well. But today, we've been focusing God's provision. So finally, I just want to ask Bronya for any answers to prayer that we've seen on the soup run. Uh, ways that we've seen God's provision, there's just turn out moments where it has to be God at work. Um, and then let's just end with a story of encouragement. Thank you, so, but 
several little examples, but um, I think over the last few years, the examples are endless. Firstly, when we looked at starting prayer pastors, we were told there would very definitely be an opposition to our presence and we would not be allowed to do this. We've never encountered opposition. We are in fact not only accepted, but we are supported and encouraged. And some of the people that we were told might be against us have actually brought people on the soup run to us and say, will you pray for this person? So that I think is a just absolutely massive answer to prayer for us over the years. In the early days especially, we'd often feel an unease, an aggressiveness when we were getting towards a stop and you could feel it in the air, and it could be quite frightening, this tension in the air. We'd put a quick message on the WhatsApp, you know, explaining this, and we'd feel, as people prayed, we'd feel a real peace descend. It just so happened. It just so happened many, many times. And one situation that my Tom will tell you about, one situation was diffused by the donut. So do go and ask him how he diffused quite a serious, what was going to be a big fight with a donut. I'd read a book at one stage by a lady called Heidi Baker. She wrote of modern day miracles in the work she was doing, of food being multiplied to be enough when they had food for maybe 20 and food was suddenly available for 200. They fed 200. And I said to God, wow, I just love that. I'd love to see that. Well, it just so happens that one of the first times I went out, everybody was asking for hot chocolate. And I just knew we were going to run out. But this chocolate pot, I kid you not, just went on and on and on. And everybody who wanted hot chocolate had hot chocolate. It, it was like the magic porridge pot that you hear in the children's stories. It was absolutely amazing. And I just praise God that, you know, I'd asked him to see that, and I have seen that multiple times. It's always difficult to gauge the amount of food we, we give out or keep back. We prepare food for 80 to 90 these days, which is a huge task. But as Zoe said, we often do need what we call the affection, affectionately call the loaves and fishes prayer. And that is literally what people, uh, the prayer pastors, will put on the chat. Loaves and fishes prayer, please. We're running out of food. And we pray, Jehovah Jireh, our provider. We pray to have enough. And I don't believe God has ever let us down with that. The provision is often as simple as we just so happen to have missed a tray of food that's been stowed away in the minibus. The numbers might be low at the final stop. Therefore, we don't need as much food. Karen from Mutley Baptist answered once by reading on the chat that we needed food and she brought out a whole big tray of sandwiches she'd prepared ready for the Wednesday. So that's churches working together. And we've even had clients sharing their food bags at the last stop because they see others have come along late and there's no food left. So they will share the little they have. Uh, my, as I said, my Tom will be more than happy to tell you of some of his experiences and God incidences, where God has so many times stepped in. But I just wanted to mention the other week, the last time I was out, I was speaking to a guy that who the week before had lost his mum, followed by his brother a few days later. Our prayer pastor had made such an impression on him because he'd actually asked, what, what was your brother like when he was alive? What did you enjoy doing together? And this guy was just bowled over by the fact that our prayer pastor cared enough to ask those questions. And it had made a simple thing maybe, but it made such a difference. So many answers to prayers. And that's just the tip of the iceberg. As um, those of you know the Val, she would have said, it is just thrilling. Prayers appropriate for accommodation, appropriate, sorry, prayers for appropriate accommodation, interviews for jobs, health centre appointments, the list seems end endless. Most recently, the provision of a prep team for tomorrow night. Praise God for his faithfulness. Where do we go from here? Over the next few months, we're hoping to look at all we're doing, 
so that we can be as effective as possible, making a real difference to the lives we encounter. What that looks like for now, God only knows. But I know it's exciting, and I know God is with us in this. We are expectant upon him, and he does not disappoint. So look out for some It Just So Happens coming this way, I think. Thank you, Bronya. Thank you for sharing that and encouraging us with what we are practically involved in and how God is at work through that. And John was just sharing with me before the service started, is it Einstein that says that coincidences are just when God works anonymously? And I think that's what we're seeing. We're seeing God at work and we're seeing God use his church through the practical work of the soup run. But I'm going to invite the band to come and help lead us in worship again. And we're going to sing together in a moment, Everyone Needs Compassion. And I just pray that God would be speaking to us about how we could practically respond today, showing his nature to others, God's consistency, where he is at work, and praying that God would provide for whatever your need may be this morning. As ever, our prayer team are here and on hand and would love to pray for you. And they're going to be at the back as we worship. And I've just asked them this morning to pray a blessing over anybody that would like to receive the same blessing that Boaz gives to Ruth in as such, where, she, where he prays that she would find refuge under the shelter of God's wings. So if that is a blessing that you'd like to receive this morning, just knowing the comfort and the protection of God, then our team are at the back, but they're also here to pray for you in any way. If you feel God stirring you to practically get involved, then this morning is Pentecost Sunday. So we pray that his church would be empowered, filled with his Holy Spirit, ready to do the work of his church. But as Bronya was sharing some encouragements, stories of God's provision, then as we worship in a moment, if anyone here has a story of God's provision that they want to share with the, with the church this morning, then come and share with John and we can use that as part of our response. But I invite you to stand with me now as we worship. And let's use this as a song, as a declaration that he is mighty to save, that he is a compassionate God, that he is the God that never changes. He is the same yesterday, today and forever. And I just pray that God would use his church to extend his compassion to the world that needs it. And I just pray that people would find refuge and shelter under the protection of his wings. And that we would see stories and stories and stories of as it just turns out to be the case where God is at work. So let me pray for us as we respond in worship this morning. Father God, we do declare that you are mighty to save. And that we are a church on mission to extend your compassion, to reveal your nature to a world around us. And I just want to praise you this morning for stories of testimony, uh, for loaves and fishes, prayers answered. And Lord, we just pray that you would continue to use us. Would we see you at work? Just like Jacob wrestling with God turns round and says, surely God was in this place and I wasn't aware of it. Lord, we declare that you are at work and we want to be a part of that. So use your church, we pray, practically this morning. Fill us up by your spirit as we find refuge under the shelter of your wings and extend that to others. Come and share stories of provision this morning to encourage us if you have one on your heart, but let's respond in worship now. Jehovah Jireh, you are worthy to be praised in Jesus' name.